thank you for having me in Chicago. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to give this talk. So I'll, I'll be talking uh, about subset sums. This is uh, a topic that goes back a long time in number theory. Um, it overlaps with combinatorics and some of the results I'll talk about uh, pull tools from uh, probability and analysis. So uh, the work I'll talk about today is joint with uh, uh, two collaborators, David Conlin, who's a professor at Caltech, and Hoi Pham, who's a second year PhD student at Stanford. Um, and uh, so this is based on joint work with um, my clever co collaborators. Right, okay, so subset sums uh, have appeared in number theory for thousands of years. Um, uh, one famous example of a problem of this sort is Goldbach's conjecture that every even integer at least four is the sum of two primes. Um, and this is uh, a page, uh, this is a letter from uh, Goldbach to Euler uh, where he explains this uh, problem to Euler. Um, another uh, a well-known theor uh, theorem in this area uh, is Gauss's Eureka theorem that every positive integer is the sum of three triangular numbers. And uh, this is a, a page from uh, Gauss's diary where in the middle he writes Eureka number equals triangle plus triangle plus triangle. Um, and there, there are many theorems and conjectures along these uh, lines uh, there's Lagrange's four square theorem that every positive integer is the sum of four squares. There's the Hilbert Waring theorem about representing numbers as sums of higher powers. And there are many results about, in general, about representing integers as uh, sums of elements from some special uh, sparse sequence. Um, and uh, the results I want to tell you about today um, these results that I've mentioned so far are about representing by a small number of elements from this, from a special sequence. And the results I'll tell you about today and problems uh, don't have this sort of restriction. Uh, so you, you don't care about the number of, uh, of elements you need to use to get it, just that you can represent as a subset sum or subsequent sum. Okay. Good. So uh, you see the slide complete sequences? Here? Yeah. Great. So uh, we're going to let A be a sequence of positive integers. Sometimes we'll uh, let A be a set. So either way, it'll be this, uh, it won't really matter. And um, sigma of A is going to be the set of inter integers representable as a sum of distinct terms of A. Okay. Um, uh, the set A is called complete if every sufficiently large integer is in sigma of A, and entirely complete if every positive integer is in sigma of A. And these sorts of ideas have been uh, studied for, in fact, thousands of years. For example, uh, the powers of two uh, form an entirely complete sequence um, because we can represent positive integers in base two. Uh, and uh, however, this notion of completeness is rather fragile. Uh, if you just delete one element from this sequence, uh, you get a sequence which is not complete and you get about half of the positive integers uh, can be represented as a sum of elements from just deleting any power of two from the, the sequence of powers of two. So it's a rather fragile property, uh, this notion of completeness. Um, and there are many other results in this area. Uh, a result of Sprague from the 40s uh, shows that the powers of the perfect kth powers is a complete sequence um, for each positive integer k. Uh, one might think that this immediately follows from the Hilbert Waring theorem. In the Hilbert Waring theorem, you're allowed to represent uh, uh, integers using the same uh, perfect kth power more than one. So this is a this is almost, a, uh, almost follows from the Hilbert Waring theorem. Um, and, uh, um, and one might ask uh, many questions about complete polynomial sequences and other sorts of sequences. A, a nice result of Birch from the late 50s show that if you have uh, co-prime positive integers, P and Q, uh, 
that are at least two, uh, the powers of P times the powers of Q form a complete sequence. Um, and this is a, done in, in a nice constructive way. Um, these examples I've been talking about are rather sparse uh, sets of integers. And um, the set of even numbers is a dense set of integers, uh, but it's not complete. And the reason why it's not complete is for modularity reasons that you can't represent the odd numbers as, uh, as sums of even numbers. Um, so we, we can sort of see two different reasons why a sequence might not be complete. Uh, one is for some modularity reasons. And uh, another reason is that the sequence just might be very sparse. And so for some counting argument, you can see that you can't represent uh, uh, sufficiently large integers. Are there any questions so far about this? There's a, a very simple, nice characterization of entirely complete sequences. We don't have anything like this for complete sequences. So for entirely complete, there's a really simple characterization. And uh, this is due to Graham, uh, Ron Graham um, in the 60s. Uh, a set of integers is entirely complete if and only if the first, so we write it in increasing order, if the first integer is uh, one, and then the kth integer in the sequence uh, is not too large. So it's at most the sum of the previous terms plus one. And uh, this can be proved uh, fairly simply. Um, if ak minus one is greater than the sum of all the previous terms, uh, then ak minus one is not gonna be in sigma of a because if you represent it as, a, if you try to represent it as a sum of elements that are smaller uh, than ak, you just won't get enough. And if you use an element bigger than ak, you'll be above uh, uh, ak in the sum. And the other direction you can prove by induction on k that sigma of the of the set of the first k elements of the sequence um, is just the interval from one to the sum of, of uh, the, the aj's. And uh, this is proved by induction. When you add ak plus one, you get the same interval shifted by ak plus one. And so this sigma then would be, um, would be the union of two intervals. They overlap. And the largest term of the, uh, in those two intervals will just be the sum of all the elements. Um, and so it's a very simple uh, uh, proof uh, of this fact. And uh, Graham had a very simple lemma um, that's a quite useful tool uh, for showing integers uh, can be represented. Once you get an interval uh, of integers represented, and then you have some additional elements to use, you can extend that interval if those elements are not too long compared to the length of the interval. So uh, suppose sigma of a contains all of the int integers in the interval from x to x plus y. And if you have a positive integer a that's at most y and a is not in a, then when you take sigma of a union a, uh, you get all the inter integers in the interval from x to x plus y plus a. And this is just, you get the union of two intervals that overlap in the same way. And uh, this extends this interval. Um, so you can do this uh, repeatedly and uh, get the second part of this uh, lemma. Um, and, and in this way, you're able to, uh, once you get a long interval, get a very long interval <laughs> uh, from this. So there's some bootstrapping uh, once you can show that there's a long uh, integer uh, interval in, in your subset sums. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, complete polynomial sequence, it's natural to look at which polynomial sequences are complete. We saw this example of Sprague's theorem that the powers of K are complete. Um, and so let P be a polynomial in one variable and A be the, set, the sequence of P of N uh, where N's uh, gonna be over positive integers. If A is complete, then the leading coefficient of P has to be positive. And this is because if the leading coefficient of p is negative, you only have a, a finite number of terms from a that are non-negative. Um, if the leading coefficient of p is negative, you would have only a, uh, uh, you'd only have a finite number, you certainly wouldn't be able to represent all sufficiently large positive integers. Um, 
So that's one simple necessary condition. Another simple necessary condition is that for every prime p, there's an n such that p does not divide p of n. And uh, the reason why this is necessary, if this is not true for a prime p, then uh, sigma of a is going to all everything in sigma of a is going to be a multiple of p because you're just adding a bunch of things that are multiples of p. You'll get a multiple of p. So uh, Roth and Sekeresh in the uh, late 50s showed uh, with an analytic proof that these necessary conditions are sufficient. And um, this also follows from a, a, <clears throat> a proof of castles. He proved a theorem using the circle method and it can, you can deduce this result of Roth and Sekeresh from, from this result of castles. Uh, so this, these were analytic proofs. Um, Ron Graham uh, uh, proved a more general result uh, with elementary methods. Um, and uh, so this more general result is actually more useful in practice in terms of this different characterization. Um, it's slightly more general. So if you have a polynomial P, uh, a real polynomial, you can write it um, in the following form instead of writing it based on the monomials, you can write it as a sum of binomials. Um, these binomials x choose uh, i would be a polynomial in degree i in, in x. And you can represent every polynomial of degree k in this form. Um, so these alpha i's are real numbers. And the sequence a is going to be complete if and only if the leading coefficient alpha k is positive. Um, and each of these alpha i's are going to be rational numbers. We can write as pk over qk in uh, reduced form. And the greatest common divisor of these pi's is going to be 1. So that's uh, Ron's characterization, Ron Graham's characterization of this. Um, OK, so these, this gives a nice uh, characterization of the complete polynomial sequences. Um, Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, this notion of completeness is not a very robust notion. And uh, it's, it's rather fragile. And Burr and Erdős to rectify the situation, tried to come up with a more robust notion of completeness, uh, which they called Ramsey complete. Um, so uh, we're going to let A of n denote the, the number of elements of A, or terms of A, that are among the first n positive integers. So if a was the set of, po of powers of 2, a of n would be uh, roughly log n. Um, so a set a is r Ramsey complete if for every partition of a into r subsets, every sufficiently large integer is in the union of the sigma of a i's. So this looks a little bit complicated, but actually it has a maybe a more simpler way of thinking about it. If you give every element of A one of R colors, so you R color the elements of A, you can represent every sufficiently large positive integer as a monochromatic sum so, uh, of elements from A. So a bunch of elements of A that are of the same color. That's what it means for A to be R Ramsey complete. In particular, one Ramsey complete is just complete. OK. Um, now, uh, one might wonder uh, for this notion, why is it that you're taking the union of the sigma of AIs as opposed to maybe there's just going to be a single I so that um, sigma of AI, uh, uh, so that one of the AIs is complete. So sigma of AI contains all sufficiently large positive integers. So um, that uh, no sequence will end up being uh, uh, <laughs> satisfy that condition. And the reason for that is you can use uh, two colors and color the integers between 2 to the 2 to the i and 2 to the 2 to the i plus 1, um, depending on whether i is even or odd. So color it red if it's i is even and blue otherwise. And uh, you'll notice that while you can represent every sufficiently large integer as a monochromatic sum, you can't, uh, if you color all the positive integers, you can't represent uh, uh, them all in the same color. Um, so there's a simple argument for that. So that's why it's in, in at least one of the colors. You can, you can, for each integer, there's at least one of the colors for which you can represent it as a monochromatic subset sum. Why this is the natural definition to look at. 
Um, they show that there's a two Ramsey complete sequence set A with uh, the number of elements in A up to N on the order of log N cubed. Um, and they're con they explicitly constructed A um, using uh, sums of powers of two. Uh, and uh, their argument very much depended on the fact that there were two colors. So it, it failed to work if you tried to generalize it to more than two colors. Um, and uh, uh, they've proved that if a set is two Ramsey complete, then it has to have at least a constant times log n squared elements up to n. Um, actually, in their paper, they said that this theorem is, is quite challenging <laughs> uh, to prove. And so uh, they didn't actually include a proof of this theorem. They proved a weaker result, but said that one could, with more effort, prove this result. Um, so they left uh, several open problems in this area. There were three, uh, three uh, problems that they, that they uh, asked. Um, uh, one was to improve these bounds. So close the gap between log n squared and log n cubed. Um, they also asked to show that there's a sparse R Ramsey complete sequence for R greater than two. So their me methods completely don't work uh, for R bigger than two. They didn't even know if there would be a, an R Ramsey complete sequence or three Ramsey complete uh, where the number of elements up to N is N to the little o one. So that it's, it's fairly sparse. Um, and then finally determine which polynomial sequences are R Ramsey complete. So these were the three questions they were interested in. Uh, they asked uh, at that time in the mid eighties. Um, Erdős later uh, uh, reiterated this problem several times. He listed it amongst his favorite problems and he offered uh, cash prizes <laughs> for, uh, two, for problems one and two, the solution of these uh, uh, problems. He offered $100 for the first problem and $250 for the second problem. Um, and in this joint work with David Conlon and, and Hoi Pham, uh, we solve all these problems at once. So there's one theorem that actually uh, solves all of these questions. Um, uh, okay, so um, first uh, I won't talk about polynomial sequences just yet. Um, we show that there exists an R Ramsey complete sequence for every R um, so that the number of elements in the sequence up to N is at most a constant C times R times log N squared for all N. And in the other direction, we give a streamlined proof that, um, a simple proof, so one didn't exist in the literature, although they knew how to prove it, uh, this for R is two. If A is, uh, two ran is R Ramsey complete, then it has to have at least a constant times R times log N squared um, elements up to N for all R gen. So this uh, answers this question about how sparse can Ramsey complete sequences be, uh, R Ramsey complete sequences. The second theorem um, proves a more general result for uh, polynomial sequences. Um, if you have a degree D polynomial, P satisfies uh, that the sequence P of N uh, and at least one is complete, which would be a necessary condition, then in fact, uh, you can find a sparse subsequence. Uh, there's an A, which is a subsequence of the, the P of N with A of N, um, at most a constant, depending on D, the, the degree of the polynomial P, uh, <clears throat> uh, times R times log N squared for all N, such that A is R Ramsey complete. Um, and in particular, uh, this implies that if you have a complete sequence, then it's in fact R Ramsey, com uh, a complete polynomial sequence, it's in fact R Ramsey complete for all R. So uh, polynomial sequences have this robust robustness to uh, this, to, to being Ramsey complete. Um, are there any questions? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so by the way, if I'd be interested in having something that was R Ramsey complete for all R, so then I guess it has to be growing like log N to the two plus epsilon or something and I mean. Right, so you'd have to have, uh, well, right. You'd have to have little omega of uh, log N squared uh, elements. Uh, up to n uh, for sufficiently large n. Uh, 
Uh, and it, it included, for example, that the polynomial, that if I have a polynomial that's complete, then it's R Ramsey complete. It's, it itself is R Ramsey complete for all R or anything like that. Yes. So once you take, uh, because you can find sparse subsets that have this property, um, the set itself will also have this property. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, that was, all right. Yeah. So, so that's what this uh, corollary is. Can you see this corollary? Uh, oh, now I see it, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, there might be some, is there some delay? I don't know. I mean, it could just be my brain has a delay. You know, so. Okay. If anybody, uh, if anything's getting confusing, please uh, speak up and let me know. I can't see the chat. Um, so, um, uh, with the screen share. So, uh, oh, but so far, nothing in chat. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Um, good. Okay. Uh, so I want to tell you about, um, about some of the ideas that go into the proofs of these. Um, Results. So uh, let's start just with theorem one um, that there's going to be this sparse uh, sequence, which is R Ramsey complete. Um, so, how do we uh, prove this? Um, and there's a key lemma, which is really the heart of the proof. Um, and it shows instead of a coloring result, it gives you a density type result. Uh, so, what does this key lemma tell us? Um, it says if you have an epsilon, which is between zero and a half, and n is sufficiently large, then there's a subset, we'll denote it S sub n, this is not the symmetric group, but <laughs> so it's a subset S sub n of n to 2n, um, and it's going to be fairly sparse. So the subset has at most a constant over epsilon times log n elements, and then whenever we take a subset of this uh, a prime of S sub n, that's at least an epsilon fraction of S sub n, we're gonna get an entire interval from Y sub n to three times Y sub n uh, in the set of subset sums uh, of this A prime, so in sigma of A prime. And then this, this Y sub n is gonna be roughly n times log n. So further down, we're gonna be able to represent everything from like n log n to, uh, well, 1,000 times n log n to 3,000 times n log n. This is the key lemma um, in the proof. And I'll show uh, now how you can deduce this theorem from the key lemma, and then I'll tell you about some of the ideas that go into the proof of this key lemma. OK, um, so uh, if we have this key lemma, we're going to apply it with epsilon being 1 over r and n being 2 to the i for each positive integer i which is at least some i sub naught. And then we're going to let a be the union of all of these uh, sets s sub 2 to the i that we get. Um, and so between n and 2n, uh, or, uh, but between, uh, for, for given i, um, we're going to have roughly log n in elements in this, uh, in this uh, s sub 2 to the i. Um, where n is 2 to the i. Uh, and when you do this, so it's going to be a sparse, a is going to be a, a sparse uh, sequence. Um, and consider an r coloring of the elements of a. Um, let a sub i be the set of elements in s sub 2 to the i consist of the elements of the most common color. Um, and just by pigeonhole, we know that a sub i is going to contain at least a 1 over r fraction of S sub two to the I. So by the key lemma, we know that there's, there's gonna be this long interval from Y sub two to the I to three times Y sub two to, to the I, um, which is in the, in sigma of A sub I. Um, and these intervals, they're gonna, for I sufficiently large, they're gonna overlap so that in, in a way that will, uh, they'll cover all the sufficiently large positive integers, these intervals. And so uh, we'll be able to represent all sufficiently large intervals as a monochromatic subset sum. Are there any questions about this? So it was helpful here that we put uh, three instead of something less than two um, in the uh, constant factor there. Um, uh, so if we have this key lemma, then, uh, then the theorem follows um, in, in this simple way. Okay, so now, yeah. I have a 
question about the key lemma. I mean, uh, okay, I mean, you will be happy. I find it a bit counterintuitive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the even numbers cannot be there in any noticeable fraction. Numbers yes. divisible by three cannot be there by any reasonable fraction, and etc. Yes. Some of one over p diverges. So, so how is there anything left? A positive fraction has to be left. This is a great question, and uh, um, this is really the heart of, of uh, why uh, the pr wh what makes the, the proof a little bit interesting. <laughs> so um, I'll get to it in, in a second, which will answer this, or, or less than a minute, uh, which will answer this question. Um, and I'll tell you about how you can, how is this SN chosen, which is, uh, uh, will answer uh, Lotzi's question. <laughs> Um, good, yeah, you, you really are ahead of the game here with this. Uh, so um, how do we build the set S sub n? And the answer is we're going to do this. So, so do you see the sentence, or the question, how do we build the set S sub n on the slide? Yes. OK, good. So there's no delay. Um, uh, so we do this at random. So this is a very uh, common thing to do in, in combinatorics to use the probabilistic combinatorics to, to pick a random set. and um, as Lotzi said, that uh, you can't just do this in the most obvious way. Uh, the obvious way is to take SN uniformly at random. Just take a uniformly at random subset. The problem is that half of the elements from a uniformly random subset are going to be even. And if you took A prime to be the even elements in S sub N, you're not going to be able to cover all the integers in this interval because you'll be missing all the odd integers. So uh, the natural thing to do is to uh, try to avoid this issue. Um, and uh, uh, what you do is uh, you pick it uniformly at random of this given size, but among the elements that have no prime factor less than log n over 2. And this is how you get around this divisibility issue that comes up. So the set has to be dense enough and it has to satisfy some modularity constraints for this to possibly work. But if you pick a random set that satisfies these, uh, these the sort of growth condition and the modularity condition, um, it, it works. Now there's actually a lot of slack in this log n over two. Uh, you can pick other uh, things there. So, um, but you, you, you really want to avoid having uh, small prime fa uh, too many small prime factors appearing in these numbers in SN. But, okay. Um, and uh, to prove the key lemma, you have to show that with very high probability, a random set A prime to the subset between N and 2N. And this very high probability is going to beat out the union bound. Um, so it's going to be really, uh, 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 very high. <laughs> it's not just a one minus little o one, um, but a random subset uh, a prime from n to two to the n, uh, picked in this way uh, of size four thousand times log n, and each element has no prime factor less than log n over two, satisfies that you're going to have uh, this entire interval is in the set of subset sums, and then you can union bound over all of the uh, all, all of the subsets uh, of S n. So there will be n choose epsilon sub s, uh, s sub n, the size of s sub n choose epsilon times the, the size of s sub uh, epsilon times the size of s sub n uh, such subsets. So there's some union bound you have to beat, but actually you get a, a <clears throat> this, this fails to hold with a super exponential uh, Lelo probability. Um, okay, uh, good. So um, instead of going into the, the details of, of uh, the exact details of showing this, I want to show a general recipe for showing how sigma of A might, would contain a, a long interval. So this is an approach that works in many settings. Um, and so a lot of different theorems can be proved with this general approach. You often have to add in additional tools to make the particular application work. But this uh, general idea works. Um, Okay, so uh, suppose we have a set A of, uh, of integers. Um, <clears throat> and we'd like to show that sigma of A contains a long interval. So uh, A should be fairly, shouldn't be too sparse. And also it should satisfy some modularity 
constraints. Um, that you, basically, you, it shouldn't be uh, all even integers or multiples of three or, or nearly that. So if there's a number D so that most of the elements, almost all the elements of A are multiples of D, you can throw out the elements that are not multiples of D and then divide out by D and, and repeat until you get some nice set uh, from this process. You still have most of your elements remaining and then you'll, you'll be able to show that in what remains after you've divided out, you can show under certain conditions that sigma of A will contain a long interval. And um, after doing all this division dividing out, when you pull back to the original A, you'll be able to get a long homogeneous arithmetic regression in sigma of A. Um, that's what, what will come out of this. Uh, so the steps of this process is to partition A into a small number of subsets. Usually you just do this equitably. Um, and in, in most applications, it doesn't really, you don't do it in any thoughtful manner, just arbitrarily works. Um, and L often is even a constant in, in, in most of these applications. Um, and then the main step of the proof is to partition A sub I into uh, B sub I and C sub I so that the set of subset sums of B sub I is large modulo each element in C sub I. And um, if A is picked at random, uh, the way to do this is to show that when you greedily add elements uh, one at a time, that the set of subset sums, it at most doubles because you get two choices at each step, but it, it often gets close to doubling and unless it gets very dense. Um, so with, with good probability. Uh, okay, so this is uh, step two. Step three, using the previous step, you can obtain that sigma of AI uh, is large. Um, and, uh, uh, there's a, a lemma that's going to be helpful for that. And then finally, using that each uh, sigma of AI is large, you can show that the, their sum set, and hence sigma of A, contains a long interval. So I'm going to say a little bit more about some of these uh, steps. Going from two to three, um, there's a simple but useful claim here. If you haven't positive integer C and B is a subset of the integers with C not an element of B, and you look at the size of sigma of A, but you only consider it modulo C. So you look at what the elements are modulo C. Um, if the size of that set modulo C is at least H, then when you add C in, you grow by an additive H. Um, and this is by looking at the non-empty congruence classes in sigma of A. When you add C in, you get at least one additional element into sigma of A union C. Um, and, and so that's a simple claim, but it's uh, quite useful. And then, so that, that's helpful for getting three from two and getting four from three, uh, there's a, a nice lemma of Lev. Um, if you have L subsets of integers and each AI is big, uh, at least N, and each AI is a subset of an interval of at most Q plus one elements and here, uh, um, L is at least roughly Q over N. Um, and none of these AIs is a subset of an arithmetic progression of common difference greater than one. Then you end up getting that the integers that can be represented as a sum of one element from each AI contains an interval of length at least L times N minus one plus one. Um, and so this is helpful going from very dense subsets of intervals to actually intervals uh, in, in this process. Um, okay, so are there any questions about this? This is kind of a, just a, a, a general recipe for, the, for, for proving results of this sort. Uh, I'll discuss a few variants of this, uh, of this original problem next. Um, so we were talking about coloring results and in the coloring result, we had a lemma that looked like a density type theorem. Um, in Ramsey theory, uh, this is a very natural thing to ask. Uh, if you have a coloring result, you also have a density type result. Um, so a, a famous example of this is Van der Veerden's theorem. If you finitely color the positive integers, there's going to be arbitrarily long monochromatic arithmetic progressions. And this theorem was later strengthened by Samaretti, who proved that uh, every dense set of integers contains arbitrarily long arithmetic regressions. So you just have to look at the densest 
of these colored classes, that colored class would end up having arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. So there are a number of theorems of this type, these density type theorems, and one can naturally try to ask if there's similar things that are true for, uh, for completeness. So uh, this is a, a new notion uh, of epsilon complete, although it, it seems uh, this density complete notion is, is very natural to consider. So a set A is epsilon complete if every subset of A, which has at least epsilon fraction of the elements up to N for N sufficiently large is complete. So this is a different notion of robustness for completeness. And um, a natural question is how sparse can an epsilon complete sequence be? Um, well, unlike uh, this Ramsey complete, it's not a, a monotone property. In fact, the, the set of all positive integers is, is not uh, gonna be um, bigger than a half uh, complete because if you look at uh, the even integers, uh, that you pick that to be a prime, um, that's not a complete sequence and that has density about a half. So uh, the integers aren't, compl aren't epsilon complete, but, um, it, uh, but you can ask this sort of question still and, and there are examples. So like the primes, for example, if you take any subset of the primes up to N, which has at least square root of N, primes, you take a, a subsequence of the primes, which has at least square root of n primes times some big constant up to n, that will be uh, a complete sequence. And so um, the primes uh, you can show are, are epsilon complete for, uh, uh, for, um, uh, for, for small epsilon. And uh, so, but that has roughly square root of n elements up to n. Um, and uh, there are some properties that a, a, an epsilon complete sequence A must satisfy. There's two <laughs> natural conditions, a modularity and growth condition. Um, the modularity condition is that for each prime P, the multiples of P and A have density at most epsilon. So it can't uh, have too many even elements. It can't be uh, uh, too dense in, in, in any, uh, you can't have too many multiples of a small prime. And then, um, you also have, you have some growth condition that uh, there's gonna exist a positive integer C such that uh, the kth element of your uh, sequence has to be at most the sum of the uh, AIs where I goes up to epsilon K plus C. Um, it can't grow too fast. Otherwise uh, you can come up with a, a, sub, a subsequence which satisfies this epsilon fraction property, but is not complete. Um, and uh, what we show is that a random sequence, roughly we what we show is that a random sequence satisfying the modularity and growth conditions is almost surely epsilon complete. Um, and then in particular, we have the following theorem, which tells us how sparse it answers this question. Uh, so consider, uh, a sequence of integers defined recursively, you have some initial uh, integers, positive integers, f1 to ft. Um, and then the for m bigger than t, you're going to define fm to be the sum of the fi's for i at most epsilon m. And uh, these sequences, uh, the, their growth will actually be within a constant factor of each other. If you have any two sequences like this, uh, they'll be within a constant factor, which will depend on the initial terms. Um, and the, the nth element in the sequence is gonna be roughly like two to the log n squared. So it's gonna grow faster than polynomially, but it's still quasi polynomially uh, growth. Um, and uh, the theorem says, if you have an epsilon complete sequence, then the kth element in the sequence has to be big O of F sub K of this particular sequence growth. And uh, there exists an epsilon complete sequence A with the kth element being on the order of F of K. So this is really the, 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 uh, <clears throat> the fastest growing uh, sequence that you can have um, of elements that is epsilon complete. Um, right, so how do you pick such an A? Um, you can pick it so that it interlaces the elements of fi for i sufficiently large. Uh, 
So you're going to pick a random element between fi and fi plus one, and that will be the ith element of your sequence. Um, but you pick it at random condition on not having small prime factors. Um, and you show that that will satisfy this epsilon completeness condition. And uh, because of this interlacing property, it'll satisfy the, this, this last condition. Are there any questions about this? Okay. Yeah, the, the proof of this is, uh, has some similarities to the proof of the coloring result, but it's, it's, it's considerably more involved. Um, this whole paper that uh, this talk is based on is, is over 70 pages, so I, I can't uh, go over all the proofs. Um, but I I'll, wanted to just give you a few highlights of some of the interesting results and, and some, a few open problems in this area. Okay, um, so uh, I, I want to uh, finish this particular topic of completeness and Ramsey completeness with a couple of open problems. Um, so one open conjecture that we have uh, would extend this result of Birch. Um, suppose you have R plus one pairwise relatively prime integer. So they're not necessarily prime, but they're pairwise relatively prime. And the conjecture is that the sequence p1 to the i1, p2 to the i2 uh, of elements of this form, powers of these pi's multiplied by each other, um, is Ramsey r complete, if, you, if it's r plus one. Um, one can show that it's not Ramsey r plus one complete. Uh, you can come up with an r plus one coloring um, where you assign uh, one of these integers a color j for which i j is non-zero and j is less than or equal to r and color r plus one otherwise. The elements of color r plus one um, are just gonna be the, perf the powers of p sub r plus one. And uh, that's a fairly sparse sequence. So you're not gonna be able to represent many integers as the sum of elements from the powers of p r plus one. And uh, the elements of color j are all multiples of p sub j. Um, and, uh, you won't be able to cover all sufficiently large positive integers uh, through these multiples and the, the last sequence is very sparse. So this is uh, why the sequence is not R plus one Ramsey complete. We uh, think this would be a nice question to, to solve in this area. Um, all these proofs of existence of these sparse Ramsey complete and density complete sequences are based on taking random sequences um, that, that give you nearly optimal bounds. Uh, essentially, the give optimal bounds are, are based on random sequences that we don't know how to uh, come up with a, uh, an explicit construction. The, the proofs very much rely that we have now on um, using randomness. And uh, I think this is an interesting question to find explicit constructions of R Ramsey complete that are sparse and density and epsilon complete. Okay. Um, the, uh, so, uh, up until now, we were talking about representing sufficiently large positive integers as uh, a sum of elements from a, a, a sparse sequence, a sparse set, or, or as a monochromatic sum. Uh, there's also been a lot of work done on trying to understand what if I want to represent a particular number n as a monochromatic subset sum. So this is a, a very natural looking question that was introduced by Erdős in the 1980s. Uh, let f of n be the minimum r such that there is an r coloring of the positive integers from 1 to n minus 1 so that no monochromatic subset sums to n. And the question is, uh, how does f of n behave? <laughs> um, so uh, just to get a little bit of a feeling for this problem, uh, here's an example. Uh, can you see the colors here? The, the numbers colored red, blue, and green from 1 to 22 on the slide. What? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Yes. So, um, uh, so this example shows that f of 23 is at most three. This is given by just greedily coloring. So I'm gonna color red as long as I can so that no subset sums to 23. And if you look at the elements, the integers from one to six, they add up to 21, which is less than 23. So uh, um, you can color one to six, all one color and miss 23 as a subset sum from the, the red integers. And then you end up coloring blue as long as you can. And um, you can color seven to 11 blue. 
And then uh, 12 to 22, you can color all green, and, and you're not going to be able to get 23 as a monochromatic subset sum. Um, to see, the, so, so we saw why the red integers aren't going to sum to 23. They, they add up to too small of an integer. Uh, the green integers, they're all bigger than 23 divided by 2. And so there's uh, no way that you're going to be able, they're all smaller than 23. So once you add at least two of them, you get bigger than 23. And uh, between 7 and 11, those integers are all bigger than a third of 23, but less than a half of 23. And so if you sum any two of them, uh, you're still under 23. But if you sum three or more, you're above 23. Um, and this generalizes uh, to give a, where the greedy coloring shows that you end up using about square root of n over two colors if you just greedily color. Um, and uh, this turns out not to be close to best possible. Uh, Erdős uh, first proved that um, uh, this f of n is actually uh, less than n to the one third, little o n to the one third. Um, and he asked if f of n grows like n to the one third minus little o one. He suspected that that was the case. Um, and uh, he didn't even know to show that f of n grew at least n to, like n to the epsilon for any epsilon. Uh, and so he asked uh, this question and he thought that even proving n to the epsilon would be interesting uh, for this problem. Uh, later, uh, Noga alone and Erdős uh, solved this question of Erdős, uh, and they proved that f of n grows roughly like n to the one third, but up to some logarithmic factors. <laughs> um, so uh, in the upper bound, uh, there's it's roughly n to the one third divided by log n to the one third, and there's some extra log log factor. And the lower bound, they got an, a log n to the four thirds in the lower bound. Um, and so these are off by roughly log n, the lower and upper bound. Um, and Alone and Erdős conjectured that the upper bound is closer to the truth between these. Uh, and uh, Vu, Van Vuen proved the lower bound uh, by reducing 4 thirds to 1. It's still off by log n to the 2 thirds. And uh, using the ideas that I mentioned earlier and some additional ideas, we were able to determine f of n up to an absolute constant factor. Um, this f of n uh, is within an absolute constant factor of n to the one third divided by log n to the one third. Uh, and there's also a log log n to the two thirds of the denominator. In the numerator, there's an n divided by phi of n, this Euler Toten function. Um, and uh, n divided by phi of n is always at least one. And it's at most roughly log log n. Um, for most integers n, uh, phi of n is uh, n over phi of n is, is like a constant, but uh, um, if n is highly divisible by small primes, uh, n over phi of n will be like log log n. And in that special case that n is highly divisible by small primes and n over phi of n is like log log n, uh, indeed the upper bound in that special case of, of alone and Erdős is close to, to best possible. Um, it is tied up to a constant factor. And, uh, it, but for most n, it's off by a log log n factor, roughly. Um, okay, so uh, these uh, bounds look very uh, uh, technical. Um, this uh, might remind you of the uh, joke about the Drowning number theorist uh, saying log, 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 uh, <laughs> asking for a log. Um, but uh, right, okay. So, um, what does this R coloring look like that they introduced uh, that doesn't have N as a monochromatic subset sum? So, we're going to let R be uh, the C times N to the one third times log N to the negative one third times log, log N to the one third. I'm going to describe this coloring uh, that. Uh, does not have n as a monochromatic subset sum, uses r colors uh, that, that Alone and Erdős came up with, and, and then we're going to show a, an improved coloring. Um, and uh, so there are certain natural color classes to, to, to work with, and we saw already from the greedy coloring uh, 
suggests that one should take long intervals and use those. So there are three types of colors classes that we're going to use. The first type, and this is going to, we're going to use uh, half the colors for this. Um, we're going to color the integers between n over j plus 1 and n over j color j. And in doing this, when we take uh, any j or fewer elements of color j, their sum is going to be less than n. But if we take j plus 1 or more elements from this interval, uh, so j plus 1 or more elements of color j, we're going to have a sum that's more than n. And so we're not going to be able to represent n as a monochromatic subset sum in color j. So these intervals co color all the positive integers bigger than n over uh, uh, 2n over r. So all the big elements get colored from these half of the color classes. That's a very natural type of coloring to try. A second type of coloring uh, to try is to use multiples of a prime. So for each of the first r over 4 primes p that you do not divide n, so for example, if n is odd, uh, we could, one of the primes that we would use is, is 2, uh, color the multiples of p using one color. And then all of the monochromatic subset sums would be multiples of p. And since p does not divide n, then uh, we would not be able to represent n as a monochromatic subset sum. Now, these two types of colors, we use 3 quarters of all the possible colors. Um, they don't cover all the positive integers, but uh, they cover a lot of them. And the ones that are remaining are fairly small. So in the type 3, they group the remaining uncolored elements into r over 4 color classes, each with some less than n. And there's not many. Uh, the sum of the elements is not that large, so you can actually do this. And if you optimize, you end up getting that you can pick r to be this particular uh, uh, bound from the theorem. Um, so it's a bit involved, but there are three natural, the first two uh, are very natural types of color classes to try based on sort of size and modularity uh, con conditions. And um, uh, the third is just to, to get the remaining elements in some, some kind of small garbage sets <laughs> that are color classes. Okay, um, so how can you improve on this coloring? Whoops. A little bit too big. Okay. Um, okay. So um, the, we'll we'll still use the first two types of colors, but we'll be a little bit more careful with the third type of color classes. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to pick an integer d, which is maximum, which that's relatively prime to n, and uh, b of d is less than r over sixteen. And for each element, uh, each unit in uh, mod d, we're going to let x sub t uh, be uh, the integer from 1 to d, uh, which is congruent to n over t mod d. Um, oops. OK. Then if you have a sum of elements a a sum of ai's, which add up to n, and each ai is congruent to t mod d, then uh, S is going to have to be congruent to X sub T mod D. So we're going to end up using one color class consisting of those A that are congruent to T mod D with A at least N over X sub T. And then we would have to use fewer than X sub T to add up to N. But from the previous uh, line, we see it has to be congruent. The number of terms has to be congruent to X sub T mod D. So we wouldn't be able to get those as a monochromatic subset sum. We'll use another for those a that are congruent to t mod d with a between n over xt plus d and n over xt. And there we would again have uh, to use between x sub t and x sub t plus d elements to sum up to n. But the number of terms has to be congruent to x sub t mod d. So we wouldn't get that as a monochromatic uh, subset sum. And finally, for the remaining uncolored elements, um, uh, uh, they're all going to be uh, small, and we're going to group them into uh, uh, size D color classes. They're all going to be less than N over D, and we're going to group them into size D color classes, and so they're just too small to, to add up to, to N. So it's a bit involved coloring, um, but this actually turns out to be optimal up to a constant factor. And 
one uh, can see this in the in the proof. It's it's a bit involved, uh, but um, you can show that in fact this is the optimal number of colors up to the constant c, big C. Um, one interesting thing about the number of uh, about this f of n uh, is that um, it's non-monotone. So this n over phi of n uh, it, it, it depends heavily on n. So uh, it can in some sense, near n, if n is prime or if n is highly divisible by small prime factors, it can fluctuate uh, by a factor log log n roughly. And um, so it really depends on the number of theoretic properties of, uh, of n, um, which was not so clear from the earlier results uh, in this area. Okay. Um, uh, so I wanna uh, finish with a, a a problem that had been studied for about 70 years um, uh, in different forms um, about long arithmetic progressions and subset sums where these techniques are, are useful. Um, there's a, an old conjecture of Erdős and Folkman that was solved uh, about 15 years ago uh, by Samaradi and Vu, um, which shows that if you have a subset of integers from one to n, and uh, it has at least some big constant times root n elements, then sigma of a contains an n-term arithmetic progression. So there's gonna be a long arithmetic progression in the set of subset sums. Um, uh, there's an, another result in this area, um, uh, which uh, in some sense is stronger and in another sense is weaker. Um, an arithmetic progression is said to be homogeneous if the common difference D divides the first element. Um, and, uh, what Freiman and Sarkozy proved independently was that if you have a subset from one to n and it contains at least a constant times root n, but then they have another log n factor, then sigma a contains an n-term homogeneous arithmetic progression. So the arithmetic progression they get is, uh, satisfies this extra property. And one might wonder, is this really useful? And it turns out, um, in fact, for many applications, you really do want homogeneous arithmetic progressions. Uh, and so this was useful for many uh, applications. Sarkozy wrote a later paper where he mentioned uh, many different applications of this result. Uh, but uh, Sarkozy and, um, and uh, independently, but later Tranvu and Wood conjectured that there's a common strengthening of these results that you can get rid of the log n factor and, uh, um, and get a homogeneous arithmetic progression. And using these techniques that I mentioned earlier, plus some additional ideas, uh, we, we recently proved this result. Um, and so there, there's a lot of uh, uh, other problems in additive number theory where this is useful, um, and you can get rid of the, the log n factors in a lot of these sorts of questions. Um, so I, it looks like I'm toward the end of my time. I'll, I'll just uh, finish here, thank you.